If you've ever tried to understand the SR-71's engines, chances are you've come across these diagrams from the SR-71's flight manual. Let's face it though, they are not as clear as they could be. So let's clean it up and simplify. There we go! The whole diagram is the complete engine nacelle, made up of the airflow inlet, the Pratt & Whitney J-58 engine, the convergent divergent ejector, and the airplane body. At speeds below Mach 2, the J-58 acts like any other afterburning turbojet engine. Air flows into the nacelle through the inlet, where it's allowed to diffuse behind the supersonic shockwave before moving into the multi-stage axial compressor, which looks like this, but bigger. Here the air is compressed before heading into the burner where fuel is added for combustion. The heated exhaust turns the turbine and provides the engine's forward thrust as it's accelerated to high speeds by the ejector. The turbine turns the compressor and keeps the engine cycle going. Just after the turbine is the afterburner, where more fuel is added to the exhaust in order to get as much of the oxygen out of the air as possible. While afterburners allow for powerful bursts of acceleration, they're really inefficient, costing huge amounts of fuel for the increased force. What makes the J-58 engine so different than all other turbojets are these six bypass tubes, which you don't find on these diagrams. The tubes open when the plane is flying at speeds greater than Mach 2.2, moving compressed air from the fourth stage of the compressor directly into the afterburner. This allows the engine to act more like a ramjet, which allows the SR-71's afterburner to operate at a much higher fuel efficiency. The forward motion of the aircraft handling most of the air compression at a ratio of about 39 to 1, with the four turbine stages adding an additional compression of about 1.6 to 1. The combined action of the turbine and ramjet compression makes the J-58 a very unique type of engine, a turbo ramjet, and allows the plane to cruise at speeds that would make a normal turbojet melt. The Blackbird's inlet design is as important to allowing the J-58 to do its thing as the engine itself, so let's see how it works. In the middle of the inlet is this symmetrical spike called the inlet spike or center body, and behind it is the diffuser, where compressed air spreads out before entering the engine. At supersonic speeds, the inlet spike takes the pressure of the leading supersonic shock wave off of the engine so that the engine gets the best airflow. Inside the inlet, a second shock wave is formed called the normal, where the air coming into the nacelle transitions from low pressure supersonic speeds to high pressure subsonic speeds. Where the normal ends up inside the inlet depends on the speed at which the aircraft is moving and the shape of the inlet and inlet spike. When the aircraft hits Mach 1.6, the normal ends up in the best place inside the inlet for pressure recovery, which is the percentage of the pressure caused by the plane's supersonic flight forward that gets translated into usual pressure inside the diffuser for the engine. This ratio is a very high 90% for the SR-71 when flying at Mach 3.2. So to keep the normal in the optimal position for pressure recovery, the spike retracts 1.6 inches for each 0.1 increase in Mach number above Mach 1.6. This changes the relative geometry of the inlet, keeping the normal at the optimal position. When the plane reaches its cruising speed of Mach 3.2, the external shock wave is positioned directly at the inlet's lip, called the cowl, and the inlet spike is retracted 26 inches. It's at this speed that the J-58 turbo ramjet has its maximum fuel efficiency, with the pressure recovery at the inlet doing most of the air compression work for the afterburner. Okay, now that we've seen how the inlet, engine, and ejector all work together, let's look at the other details found inside the engine nacelle. Positioned inside the cowl is a cowl bleed that captures some of the incoming air and passes it through a ring of circular openings called shock traps that drop the airspeed to subsonic and guide it through the nacelle body around the engine for cooling. The air is drawn out of the nacelle by the fast-moving exhaust flowing through the ejector. At speeds below Mach 0.5, not enough air is coming through the inlet for cooling, so more air comes in through sucking doors that are positioned midway along the nacelle. These close at Mach 0.5, which the plane only hits just after takeoff and just before landing. Before the ejector are a set of tertiary doors that also open at low speeds to prevent the ejector from creating places of drag caused by not enough air and exhaust flowing through it. These close at Mach 1.2 and stay closed for most of the Blackbird's flight, opening only for takeoff, landing, and refueling. Both the suck-in doors and the tertiary doors allowed the powerful J-58 to operate at speeds much slower than its high cruise speed. The engines are so big that each needs two muscle car motors on the ground to start it and rev it up to a self-supporting speed. But I digress. The last three details found in the nacelle are required for keeping the normal shockwave in place in the inlet. The first is the center body bleed, which connects a grill on the outside of the nacelle to a set of slits on the spike through a hollow center body middle. At low speeds, the center body bleed allows the engine to pull additional air into the inlet, while at higher speeds, the bleed wicks away the boundary layer, a layer of low pressure turbulent air that normally sticks to the spike and reduces pressure recovery. Inside the inlet is a series of slots that run between the shock tubes that lead directly out of the plane. 
These are the forward bypass doors, which allow an analog computer to lower the pressure inside the diffuser by sending some of it outside the aircraft. But if the pilot wants to reduce drag during acceleration or provide additional cooling to the engine, he or she can open the aft bypass doors, which route the additional pressure through the nacelle and out the ejector. And that's it! That's how the J58 turbo ramjet inside of the Blackbird engine nacelle works. Now when you look at these diagrams, they don't seem so complicated after all. Don't forget to like... The SR-71 today remains this mysterious and enticing aircraft. It's, it's menacing, uh, it looks so sleek, uh, but really this is completely a form dictated by the function of the aircraft. We had a need to know what was going on in other countries, and the way that we were going to do that was having a photographic aircraft that could fly very high and very fast, and much faster than the U-2 which preceded it. The SR-71 was that answer for the U.S. Air Force and for the United States. The SR-71 was a tremendous leap forward in technology in many different ways. Fighters at the time could go about Mach 2, this could go Mach 3. It could fly incredibly high. Now there were aircraft that could reach the height of the SR-71 but only in a zoom climb and only temporarily, whereas the SR-71 could fly at level attitude at 80,000 feet or higher. There was no other aircraft at the time that could do that. It was a magnificent platform. It was untouchable, and yet it had not only photographic cameras, it also had systems that performed electronic intelligence as well, and it had a side-looking airborne radar, which was another sensor which was very effective. Speed in the 1960s was what stealth is today. Speed was survivability. In fact, the best way for an SR-71 to deal with a surface air missile shot at it was just simply to speed up. There are some great ways to realize and understand just how fast the SR-71 was. An SR-71 flew from Los Angeles to DC in just a little over an hour. Now imagine, in that amount of time, one would drive to the airport and maybe get your bags checked in, and this airplane flew from coast to coast in a little over an hour. Originally when the SR-71 was developed, there was the possibility that it could be used over China or even over the Soviet Union. It wasn't uh, used in that way largely due to um, diplomatic efforts, but it was used in the dangerous skies over North Vietnam during the uh, Southeast Asia War, and it was also used over North Korea during the Pueblo Crisis in 1968. Uh, and it was used in other places around the world. The Air Force operated the SR-71, an aircraft that had a capability that no other country in the world had. And the SR-71 could go get photographs and intelligence information that was desperately needed, but that no other aircraft and no other Air Force could get. The SR-71, nicknamed Blackbird and Habu, based off the designs of the A-12 and YF-12, was first seen soaring in the skies in 1964. 32 of these reconnaissance aircraft were built to help the United States keep an eye on its enemies to help maintain U.S. air superiority until 1998, yet till this day holds the fastest man-